Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be looking at the contraindications and precautions for all the common e-stim techniques. At the end of the video, we'll do the same thing for therapeutic ultrasound. What's important to understand here is that some of the contraindications and precautions, that is the ones here in this red box, are common to all of the e-stim techniques. So these would be true for TENS and IFC, iontophoresis, high voltage pulse current, and both of these over here, which are electrical muscle stimulation. But then down here at the bottom of the figure, some of these contraindications and precautions are unique to a particular technique. So that's how we read this particular table. Let's look at the top first at the contraindications and precautions for all e-stim techniques. So notice that there are no absolute contraindications, but we do have several relative contraindications. And the way a relative contraindication works is if you have one of these five things in a particular area of the body, you would never, ever use e-stim on that region or near that region. But if you had another region of the body that was fairly distant from the contraindicated region, well, on that distant site, you may be able to use one of these e-stim techniques. The first relative contraindication is an implantable cardiac device. One example would be a pacemaker, and pacemakers normally are going to be implanted on the left side of the chest. So if somebody has a pacemaker in that region, it would be contraindicated to use e-stim around the left side of the chest. Okay? Even into the left shoulder or the left side of the thorax, anywhere in that region, it's going to be contraindicated. Now, you could certainly use e-stim on the knee. You might be able to use it on the contralateral elbow, but anywhere near where that pacemaker is, it would be contraindicated. If the person has an unstable arrhythmia, same kind of thing. You wouldn't use the e-stim really anywhere near the parts of the thorax where the heart is. Okay? Placement near the carotid sinus. The carotid sinus is the area where the common carotid artery moving upwards bifurcates into the external and internal carotid arteries. So this region we would not use e-stim on. Also anywhere where there's thrombosis or thrombophoblitis, so venous inflammation or a known blood clot, we would not use e-stim on that region. Okay? And also pregnancy. So if a woman is pregnant, so really anywhere on the abdomen or sometimes even the low back on the opposite side, we would not use e-stim on those areas. But other parts of the body, we would be able to. Okay? Now, there's only one general precaution for all e-stim, and it's impaired mentation. This just basically means the patient is not cognitively sound, and so therefore, if there was some kind of issue with the technique, they may not be able to verbalize it or otherwise indicate to you that there's a problem, whether it's hurting or it's burning or something like that. Okay? So if the person has impaired mentation, you basically just need to watch out. It doesn't mean you can't do it, you just need to be careful. Then we have relative precautions for all e-stim. This is where we need to be careful if we're applying e-stim to any region where one of these factors applies. So the first one is cardiac disease. If the person has heart disease, they have impaired heart function, and there could be a lot of reasons for that. And remember, the heart runs on an electrical current, and we're applying an electrical current with e-stim. So we just need to be mindful and watchful if we're applying e-stim in any region around the, the thorax where the heart is. Impaired sensation, we just need to be careful with that. Okay? If somebody has impaired sensation, they may not be able to tell you if that region where we're applying the e-stim is burning or is painful or something like that. Okay? Also, areas of skin irritation and allergies to adhesives. The electrodes that we're applying have an adhesive on it, and sometimes you can have an allergic reaction to those, although that's most likely not life-threatening, so it's just really something to be careful of. So everything in this red box applies to all the e-stim techniques. The contraindications and precautions here on the bottom are generally unique to a particular technique. So let's go through those. Let's look at TENS and IFC. So a contraindication would be if muscle contractions might disrupt healing. Now think back to TENS and IFC. If we're doing the conventional style treatment, we're not getting muscle contraction, or at least we shouldn't be. That's where we just want a comfortable tingle. So the only thing we're stimulating there are just sensory nerves. 
Okay, So that wouldn't apply for the conventional treatment as much. But when we get to the acupuncture-like treatment, where we want to have visible muscle twitches, that's where this may actually uh, be contraindicated if we're doing the acupuncture treatment. So let's suppose we had a femur fracture and the person had some pain on their quads, let's say, and we were going to apply an acupuncture treatment to the quads. Well, we want visible muscle contraction, okay, the muscle twitch, but that's going to cause contraction of the quads, and some of the quads originate on the femur, and so they'll be pulling on the femur, and so that pulling may disrupt the healing. But again, this is more of a relative contraindication because we could certainly apply uh, this on another area where there's no fracture. Okay. Now the precautions for TENS and IFC would be malignant tumors, areas of open wounds, and to avoid potentially symptom aggravating activities after acupuncture TENS uh, because this is a very intense type of TENS and IFC and so it can create delayed onset muscle soreness. Now for iontophoresis, this technique is contraindicated in any region where there's a malignant tumor. So again, this is a relative contraindication. If the person has a tumor, let's say in the low back, sometimes you can have vertebral tumors back there, uh, you could certainly use iontophoresis in the shoulder region, okay, uh, but not in the low back where the tumor is. Okay? And also, if there's a treatment done before the ionto that alters skin permeability, well, you would not use iontophoresis in that area. Okay, so iontophoresis applies a current and drives a drug through the skin. And so one of the things that happens on the cellular level is it disrupts the skin cells. And so if you already have a treatment before that, that potentially could irritate the skin by altering the skin permeability, then you would not use iontophoresis in that region directly after that treatment. Okay? Also, if there is an area of infection, you just want to be careful when you're using iontophoresis, but it's not necessarily contraindicated. High voltage pulse current, again contraindicated for a malignant tumor. And then there's a precaution for high voltage when we're doing it over an area of infection, just like we saw for iontophoresis. Now for these last two columns, so NMES in Russian, and functional electrical stimulation, these are very similar. Uh, they're both electrical muscle stimulation or EMS. So the contraindications and precautions are going to be very similar. So really for both of them, contraindications are where when muscle contractions might disrupt healing. This is what we saw for the acupuncture setting on TENS and IFC. Again, if you have a fractured bone and you're stimulating a muscle to contract that attaches on that bone, well then the muscle is going to pull on the bone, right, and potentially disrupt that healing process. Uh, what's important to understand, though, for NMES in Russian and functional electrical stimulation is you might say it's a little more contraindicated because these give you stronger muscle contractions, okay? Particularly with NMES in Russian, we're looking for visible muscle contractions, and in FES, we may in some cases want concentric. So these are much stronger than just the twitches in TENS and IFC acupuncture. So again, contraindicated in those cases. Just in those areas, though, we could certainly use it on another part of the body where there's no fractures. And this one right here, unhealed fracture, really is true of both of these. I should have put it over here as well. But whenever there's an unhealed fracture, same kind of thing. All right. And then the precautions for EMS are also very similar. So malignant tumors, areas of open wounds, and then really to avoid potentially symptom aggravating activities. I forgot to take the acupuncture tens here out. But the whole point is we are stimulating muscles to contract, and over here we're looking at tetanic muscle contraction, and over here even into isometric and concentric. And so, again, this can be very fatiguing on muscles because we're skipping that type 1 muscle fiber activation and going directly to type 2 in many cases. So this is going to be very fatiguing and potentially can cause DOMS in a similar way to what we see over here with acupuncture tens and IFC. Now, with FES, there's some additional precautions that really have to do with the fact that the patients we do these on are often neuro patients and may have had some kind of a neurological traumatic event. So when we have a patient following a traumatic brain injury or a spinal cord injury, uh, one of the things we have to watch out for is heterotropic ossification. And so that's a precaution for functional electrical stimulation. So we want to be careful if we're using this technique in an area where we have one of these abnormal ossifications. Okay? 
Also, autonomic dysreflexia. This is applicable whenever there's a spinal cord injury at the level of T6 or above. So autonomic dysreflexia can be a problem, and if we're using FBS in an area where that's applicable, uh, then we can potentially dysregulate the autonomic nervous system, and that leads to severe problems. We talk about autonomic dysreflexia in other videos. And then if there's a spastic response to stimulation, then you're not going to want to do FBS in that way on that area, because obviously spasticity is going to make whatever activity you're doing extremely difficult. Now, the reason this is not a contraindication is because you can always change the parameters on the electrical muscle stimulation uh, to avoid the spasticity. Maybe you have to turn some settings down, turn some settings up, and you can fix the issue. But if the person's having spastic response to that FES, well, then you're not going to do it in that way, or sometimes not at all. Okay? Now, there were no absolute contraindications for e-stim. However, for therapeutic ultrasound, there is one absolute contraindication, and that is when the patient has a malignant tumor. So a malignant tumor is one that has gained the capacity for invasiveness, and it has potentially invaded many tissues of the body. And we have to assume that, and we may not even know which tissues have been invaded. Of course, there's a primary original source of the cancer, but we may not know all the tissues that it's invaded. And when we apply therapeutic ultrasound, we're applying sound waves, right? And sound waves uh, can break things apart, right? That's actually how um, a lithotripsy works if somebody has a kidney stone. You're applying sound waves and it breaks the large kidney stone into smaller pieces that can more, be more easily excreted through the urethra, right? So if we have a cancerous mass where the cells are already easily fragmented, where they can spread to other tissues, and so we don't want to be applying sound waves to any part of the body that might actually have this malignant tumor or other areas where it's spread, because that can cause even quicker spread to other areas. So hopefully that makes sense. Now we do have relative contraindications. Pregnancy, just like we saw with e -STEM, again, we're not going to want to use this therapeutic ultrasound uh, in any region where the developing infant is, uh, whether it's on the abdomen or in some cases the low back. Now, you probably are aware that you can actually see a developing infant by the use of diagnostic ultrasound, but that's different than therapeutic ultrasound. So you've seen those ultrasound images of babies. That is different than this therapeutic ultrasound. So that's actually a contraindication here. But you could certainly use uh, this therapeutic ultrasound in other parts of the body. The second relative contraindication is exposed central nervous system tissue. This is not going to be common, obviously, but there are some conditions where it may actually be exposed. There could be a traumatic injury, in which case you would not do that, or there are some genetic conditions like spina bifida where certain regions of the central nervous system are actually exposed to the elements, so you would not do it in that area. Also, joint cement, don't do it, and plastic components. The main reason you don't do it on these has to do with what's called the attenuation. So we talk about this in the actual ultrasound video, but attenuation is the ability of an object to absorb these sound waves and it heats up. The higher the attenuation coefficient, the more it heats up. And so things like joint cement, plastic components actually heat up really quickly uh, when you apply therapeutic ultrasound, and so that heating up can cause bad things to happen, and so we don't want to do it in those areas. Also within six inches of an implantable cardiac device, like a pacemaker, that's a relative contraindication that we also saw in the e -STEM. Thrombophoblitis as well, if we have inflammation of a blood vessel, we're not going to use ultrasound in that area, because that could actually cause further damage to the blood vessel if it's already inflamed. And then near the eyes and reproductive organs, we're not going to use ultrasound there. Now, there are general precautions with the use of therapeutic ultrasound. If we have an area of acute inflammation, we want to be careful because some types of ultrasound cause heating of the tissue, particularly when we're using a 100% duty cycle and we're looking for thermal effects. Well, heat can maintain or exacerbate inflammation, and so that's why we want to be careful when we're in those areas. Also, epiphyseal plates. So epiphyseal plates are not yet uh, ossified into epiphyseal lines. So these are the growth plates that allow long bones to grow prior to puberty and during puberty. And so if you have a kid that comes in and they're still growing, well, you want to be careful when you're doing ultrasound around those epiphyseal plates. And then fractures. 
Um, you want to be careful when you're doing ultrasound around fractures because you're pumping in sound waves. And those sound waves, if they are done in such a way, they could actually disrupt the healing of the fracture. And then the final general precaution are breast implants. And the reason you need to be careful is similar reasons to the joint cement and plastic components. Uh, many times breast implants are made of silicon. And silicon is a semiconductor, meaning uh, it can actually absorb not only electricity, but also heat. And so it can also heat up, although it's not going to be to the same extent as joint cement or plastic components. But you do need to be careful if you're doing ultrasound in any region where there's implants. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the contraindications and precautions to both ultrasound and all of eSTEM. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.